morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Department of Commerce and to the Cybersecurity Framework Workshop event. I am delighted to see the crowd here. It's a, um, um, a quite a large mix of different organizations and people, and I know it's going to be a really useful and important dialogue. Nearly two months ago in this room, we announced the President's Executive Order on Improving Cybersecurity for Critical Infrastructure. As we have all seen in the news, Concern about cybersecurity threats and risks has only continued to grow. Clearly, this is one of the most critical issues facing both our nation's security and our nation's economy in the 21st century. Protecting America's businesses and America's infrastructure from attacks is crucial to ensuring that our economy continues to grow. The question is, how do we do that? And there's only one viable answer, which is together. That's what today's discussions are all about. How do we do this together? The good news is this. Many innovative approaches to cybersecurity challenges already exist in businesses and organizations around the country. And I'm sure that a good number of you who are here today have implemented cybersecurity enhancements in your own firms and perhaps in your industry groups and associations as well. Sharing and spreading those ideas and approaches more broadly has never been more important. The executive order, recently signed by President Obama, directs the Commerce Department's National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, to develop a voluntary program, a framework, that will promote best practices at, criti at critical infrastructure facilities. To build this framework, we need to hear from industry about the best practices and standards that should be included. As many of you know, NIST has a century-long track record of close and successful partnerships with industry, tackling a large number of complex scientific and engineering challenges. For example, we worked with some of the firms represented here today to develop voluntary frameworks for smart grid interoperability and security, and similar work on health IT. Today, NIST Director Patrick Gallagher and his team are eager to hear more about how we can collaborate effectively and nimbly across sectors. We want to hear that from you. What are you doing now to reduce cybersecurity risks? What are the threats that you face? And what threats do you anticipate in the near future? How can the marketplace for new technologies and services best meet your cybersecurity needs? And how can we continue to grow this partnership in the most useful and effective way in the months and the years ahead. The input we receive today is going to add to written comments that we're receiving in response to our request for information. In that RFI, we ask how people like you currently manage cyber risk, what standards and policies you use, and what challenges you face. Those responses are due on Monday, so we look forward to that input as well. And the timing of this event and that Monday um, deadline um, it really is designed to bring all of this information together at the same time. As NIST analyzes these responses and begins to develop a framework, we will continue to host more public workshops like this one throughout the country. I know that the first one, I understand, is already set up at Carnegie Mellon, um, sharing and refining ideas along the way. And we will move quickly because the first draft of the framework is due um, in just eight months, which is going to come fast. The long-term goal is to develop a living framework that adapts to the risks that are out there and that will change over time and that relies on industry-developed standards to help businesses and organizations know when and where they may be behind the curve and how to catch up. Constant awareness of both evolving threats as well as technological advances in cybersecurity have to become the norm. Again, and I can't emphasize this enough, the success of this effort is largely dependent on industry involvement. You are the ones who can help empower owners and operators of critical infrastructure make the best possible decisions with regard to cybersecurity. Once the framework is published, the Department of Homeland Security will create a voluntary program for its implementation in critical infrastructure areas, such as water, electric, nuclear, and transportation. And in fact, a little later, you're going to hear from DHS Deputy Secretary Jane Lute, who will talk about how DHS is implementing its responsibilities under the executive order and the presidential policy directive. I believe she will also discuss how DHS is building a process to allow increased threat sharing information with industry. And while DHS develops those programs, NIST will continually receive input from industry leaders 
and the public to ensure that the framework remains current and flexible. More immediately, and also as part of the executive order, the Departments of Commerce, Treasury, and Homeland Security are required to report to the President on the most effective incentives to encourage even more companies to become involved with this framework. To that end, I'm pleased to say the Commerce Department has just issued a notice of inquiry. We're asking for opinions from you and other stakeholders on what incentives might work best to get industry really involved in this process. I'm sure we'll get comments in areas ranging from tax incentives to liability protections and more. Public comments are open until April 27th, and I want to thank you in advance for your insights and really encourage you to give us your best ideas. In closing, now more than ever, we need your commitment and your leadership to help protect America's business and America's infrastructure. The President understands this is going to take a whole-of-government approach, an approach that draws on the most advanced ideas, the strongest efforts, and the best practices in intelligence, security, law enforcement, and economic agencies. But he knows the government cannot and should not do this alone. We must work hand-in-hand -hand with all of you to ensure that America's businesses will be both aware of cybersecurity problems and proactive in adopting the best practices to protect themselves and our economy. Today's program is designed to help build this public-private partnership. You have a great lineup of speakers and panelists who reflect a diverse cross-section of sectors and expertise areas. So to get us started, we're going to begin by hearing from White House Cybersecurity Coordinator Michael Daniel. As you may know, he and the national security staff at the White House worked tirelessly to ensure that a broad set of stakeholder views were reflected in the executive order before it came out. He will be talking about cross-government implementation of the executive order. So thank you all for coming. I hope you have a wonderful and productive day. And let me uh, please join me in welcoming one of the nation's leaders on national security and cybersecurity issues, Michael Daniel. Michael. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for that nice introduction. I'm pleased to be here with so many of you. And it's great to see the, uh, the auditorium uh, full again. Uh, the last time I was here, we were actually rolling out uh, the executive order, so it's really uh, exciting to be uh, at this point. Um, as the Secretary said, when we were doing the uh, prep work for the executive order and we were trying to get it together, um, we did a lot of uh, outreach and uh, listening sessions with industry. And when I was at RSA uh, a couple of, uh, at the end of February, uh, several of the people that we had talked with during that process came up to me and said, not only did you listen to us, but you managed to figure out how to make a lot of this work on us. Um, and what the Secretary said is really quite true. This, is, this effort is only going to succeed not just with the participation of industry, but with the enthusiastic leadership of industry. It's going to require everybody's effort in order to get where we want to go. Now at RSA, I spoke about the new normal uh, environment that we're living in, where cybersecurity threats are increasingly broad, they're more sophisticated, and they're dangerous. As I said then, this, this cyber environment is not really about uh, the Hollywood vision of cybergeddon. Um, it's not about massive power outages or trains grinding to a halt everywhere. But it is about things that are really quite troubling. Persistent intrusions, violations of privacy, theft of business information, and degradation and denial of service to legitimate entities trying to do business or getting their message out on the internet. That's the new normal environment that we're living in. And a lot of what this executive order is designed to do is to try to address that new normal, to raise the baseline level of our cybersecurity across the country so that, we can, uh, so that we can address the threats that are there in the new normal. And the administration, as you can see in the executive order, we see a clear government role in assisting owners and operators of critical infrastructure in their efforts to prevent and manage cyber threats. That means we're going to be sharing a lot more actionable information with you. Um, for example, we've shared hundreds of thousands of signatures and indicators with the private sector and over 100 nations just in the past six months. In the executive order, we committed to redoubling on that effort. As we're talking about here today, the core, another core piece of that effort is to create the, the framework of baseline, well-understood cybersecurity capabilities. 
A recent report assessed that over 90% of reported data breaches were avoidable through simple or intermediate level security measures. We really need to make the bad guys work a lot harder to try to get uh, to do what they are trying to do. <laughs> the, we need to partner with you and leverage our collective experience and knowledge to get the framework done not just on time, but done in a manner that is usable and effective. I think the, the framework, I see the framework of practices that are developed here will become the core comp practices that many companies already have in place, but we'd like to see these core practices spread and can, more consistently and wider across the critical infrastructure. Now, the development of the framework is just a start. As uh, Deputy Secretary Lute will talk about, there will have to be a, a they, will, they are charged with creating a voluntary program to promote the adoption of the practices identified in the framework and looking at leveraging incentives where possible to further incentivize ad adoption. Finally, I would just, in closing, I would say that we also know that the development of this framework and the processes going on in the executive order are just a down payment, and they're just one tool that we need to improve the cybersecurity of our critical infrastructure. We, we are seeking congressional action in this space to make sure that we firmly embed and incorporate privacy and civil liberty safeguards into all aspects of cybersecurity, that we strengthen our nation's critical infrastructure cybersecurity by further increasing information sharing, particularly from the private sector back to the government, and by promoting the adoption of the framework and the standards even more broadly, updating the federal laws that govern our, how we do our own security inside the federal government, giving law enforcement the tools to fight crime in the digital age, and harmonizing data breach notification requirements. So I just wanted to close by saying thank you. Thank you for all of your time and effort that you're putting into this. It's absolutely critical in order to make it a success. And I look forward to uh, continuing to engage with you uh, over the next eight months as we come to agreement on the framework. Thank you very much. I'm Jane Lute. I'm the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. On my way over here this morning, I was struck by an irony. Um, increasingly, I take all my material on my iPad, my daily schedule, my notes, my resource materials, uh, all of my communications uh, with staff. Uh, but you're crazy if you don't think twice about bringing an electronic device into any conference called cybersecurity, <laughs> lest you turn to your remarks and end up looking at the Magna Carta in ancient Greek. Um, and there's something wrong with that. Uh, we ought to be able to take security in cyberspace as much for granted as we take our ability to access and use cyberspace in our everyday lives. So thank you all for coming. Um, and I want to thank all of our, not only private sector partners, but federal partners as well, for the attention that we are giving as a nation to this critical issue. I can't think of any more urgent and important topic uh, for our interconnected world than the security of our identity and our information as we access that world. The increased connectivity in cyberspace has led to significant transformations. You all live it every single day. But the work on cybersecurity has become urgent. It's critical. The EO calls for aggressive timelines, and the presidential directive on critical infrastructure in this country also calls for aggressive timelines, because we know and believe as a government that we confront a dangerous combination of known and unknown vulnerabilities and adversaries with strong and rapidly expanding capabilities. The threats ranging from denial of service attacks to theft of valuable trade secrets, intrusions against government networks and systems that control critical infrastructure, all of these have become commonplace knowledge to all of you in this room. It's time we did something about it. Attacks are coming from every part of the globe, every minute of the day, constantly increasing in seriousness. So the Department of Homeland Security, as you know, four years ago, when we laid out in the first Quadrennial Homeland Security Review our core mission set, we said our job is to help create a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive. And among the most important things we thought we needed to do, together with preventing terrorism, securing our borders, administering and enforcing immigration laws, and helping to build na national resilience in the face of disaster, was to build and help ensure the nation's cyber security. We said that four years ago. And today, Homeland Security is responsible for securing the unclassified federal government networks and working with the owners and operators of the critical infrastructure across this country to help them secure their networks. 
We coordinate national response to significant cyber incidents and create and maintain a common operational picture for cyberspace across the government. We also work closely and regularly with the owners and operators of the nation's critical infrastructure to strengthen their facilities through many means, on-site risk assessments, mitigation, incident response, and as Mike said, by increasingly sharing risk and threat information in cyberspace. We have, as he said, shared hundreds of thousands of pieces of information related to threats and risks that we see in cyberspace, and we're going to do more, and we're going to do it sooner. The EO that the President signed in February calls forth the kind of sharing that we've begun and we need to intensify. To implement the executive order and the presidential directive on protecting the nation's critical infrastructure, we've stood up in the Department of Homeland Security an integrated task force that will involve participants across the government and the private sector. This integrated task force has eight working groups a group on planning and evaluation that will be responsible for leading and directing, leading the effort to evaluate the existing public-private critical infrastructure partnership model, update the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, and work together with the private sector, with sector lead agencies and other critical partners as appropriate. We have a task force on cyber-dependent infrastructure identification that's responsible for identifying critical infrastructure where cybersecurity incident could result in catastrophic regional or national effects on public health, public safety, economic security, or national security. We want to understand how best to enhance the ongoing prioritization process for all critical infrastructure. We have a task force on incentives for understanding how, when we build a voluntary uh, a, a voluntary framework that, and program that we can incentivize the participation from as wide a group of participants as possible. We want to understand feasibility, security benefits, and the relative merits of incorporating security standards into acquisition planning and contract administration. We have a working group on collaboration in the framework for coordinating the performance goals and other activities with NIST. We have a working group on situational awareness and information exchange responsible for working to identify and map existing critical infrastructure security and resilience across the federal government and identify baseline data and system requirements for the federal government and including better situational awareness for us all. We have a working group on R&D that's responsible for leading the research and development of related tasks to the EO and the PPD and here the engagement of the private sector is of course critical. We have a working group on stakeholder engagement. You'll be hearing more from us over the course of these next weeks and months as the work on the EO and the presidential directive continue. And we have a work, working group on assessments, including privacy, civil rights, civil liberties, that will, look, uh, that will engage with representatives from across the interagency and, and with the private sector and groups to support the accomplishment of individual department and agency requirements uh, under the executive order and the presidential directive. It's an ambitious work program. We're on an ambitious timeline, but the time is now. We will work with NIST very closely. They have been directed under the executive order to lead the development of the framework to reduce cyber risk to our critical infrastructure. The work that NIST will lead will be informed by the performance goals that we in the Department of Homeland Security uh, will develop as we work with critical infrastructure, again, to prioritize the greatest risk that could result in catastrophic consequences. We both, NIST and Homeland Security, recognize that there are private sector cyber leaders in the critical infrastructure sectors who are already implementing strong controls, policies, and procedures. The framework, of course, will not dictate a one-size-fits-all technological solution. Instead, it promotes collaborative, collaboration, collaborative approaches to encourage innovation and recognize differing needs and challenges within and among critical infrastructure sectors. We believe that the companies driving cybersecurity innovations in their current practice and planned initiatives can help shape best practice across all of the nation's critical infrastructure. We're actively looking for you and for your help because we know in Homeland Security, as, as we've said many times, no single department can do all that needs doing when it comes to the cybersecurity of this nation. And all that needs doing can't be done alone. We need your help 
We need you to engage, and we need it now. And now let me turn over, over uh, to Pat Gallagher and NIST, who will close out this series of opening remarks. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Let me uh, begin by thanking uh, Deputy Secretary Lute. Uh, one of the things that you've heard already this morning, just in the opening remarks, is the extent to which the executive order laid out a process of collaboration, almost more than anything. Um, and that's critically important because what we're talking about with cybersecurity is the performance of a system, a system that's bigger than any one company. Uh, it's, in fact, bigger than the government. And, in fact, it requires a partnership between uh, peer companies, between uh, companies that you depend on, maybe even your competitors. And it also calls upon a public-private partnership, and as you heard uh, Deputy Secretary Lute point out, a very uh, robust partnership even within the federal government, and, um, and that's what we're really here today to begin talking about is a key part of this framework. So this is the first of what will be a series of workshops uh, that NIST will be convening to uh, support the development of the cybersecurity framework. This is an important milestone. Uh, this is the first of these uh, workshops that uh, we will be using to carry out uh, what we've been asked to do under the President's executive order. So what I'm going to do uh, this morning is make a few remarks about our role uh, to sort of set expectations, and then I'm going to turn uh, to our first panel, and I'll be introducing them uh, to begin to look at the role of cybersecurity from the perspective of a cross-section of industry stakeholders so they can present their views on the approach of the executive order and how their companies view cybersecurity in this day and age. So let me talk first about uh, the approach we're taking to develop the framework. So uh, as we all have heard, NIST is responsible under the executive order uh, to lead the development of the framework to reduce cyber risk to critical infrastructure. And by framework, we mean that set of core standards, methodologies, procedures, processes, whatever it takes to put into practice uh, that would be applicable across sectors uh, to achieve and support this new baseline uh, that uh, you heard Michael talk about. Soon after the President's announcement uh, to support this effort, NIST issued a request for information called an RFI to ask you uh, what you are doing now. How do your organizations manage risk? What challenges do you face? What standards and policies do you already use? and many other questions. And that began our initial conversation with you in development of the framework, and one that we continue to support today. And as you've heard that, uh, this brainstorming phase, if you will, this gathering of ideas uh, uh, closes, the RFI closes next week. Today's event continues this. Um, as Deputy uh, Secretary Blank mentioned, we are asking for responses by April 8th, next Monday. Those responses will become public and will serve as the foundation for the framework process. Um, and we will follow that phase by working in forums uh, to, to uh, work with this gathered information and work hand in hand with you to organize and develop the framework. So I hope that all of you here today and all of you watching the workshop online uh, are preparing your responses because it's a critical part of this process. The R5 responses will enable us to uh, make an initial determination on what standards and practices are already in place that industry is using um, and will serve as a foundation for our efforts. Uh, our role with the framework at NIST is to support you. Uh, this is important. Um, while the President directed me to develop the framework, this is one of those cases where the right kind of leadership is to lead by following because this framework of practice is one that has to be uh, baked in uh, to your businesses and to your interest and to be put into practice uh, uh, in your, in your uh, daily lives, if you will. The President's executive order states that the framework must be technology neutral and it must enable critical infrastructure sectors to benefit from a competitive market for products and services that meet the standards, methodologies, procedures, and processes developed in the framework to address cyber risk. In other words, we will not be seeking to tell industry how to build your products or how to run your business. Instead, we are relying on critical infrastructure industries 
to dictate their needs for technology products and services and allow the market to be able to evolve in a way that embraces both security and innovation. This bottoms-up approach is not unlike NIST work in other areas that you may be familiar with, including uh, smart grid, electronic health records. It even includes our work in things like atomic clocks and advanced materials and computer chips. It's this approach that allows solutions developed nationally to scale globally as other countries uh, seek to solve the same problem. The foundational standards and practices in the framework will become the means of developing a more secure platform on top of which companies can continue to innovate. It will create a strong common language to empower collaboration and improve security. And that is why we are seeking your participation in this process. As the director of NIST, I can assure you that we will meet the president's charge to develop uh, the framework, but the product will only be useful if it's your work product, if it's based on your input. Without your participation, our assessment of where industry is may not be accurate, and the framework will not provide a proper reflection of what we can do to enhance security. So following today and the responses uh, that are due by Monday, we will be scheduling a series of uh, real workshops, multi-day events, uh, to actually roll up our sleeves with you and develop the framework. The first of these workshops has just been uh, announced. Uh, it will be hosted by Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh on May 29th through the 31st. I hear Pittsburgh's a great place to spend Memorial Day, so mark your calendars. And following that, we are tentatively uh, planning sessions during the weeks of July 15th and September 9th. So these will support the framework process before the first draft is released in October. During these sessions, the framework itself will actually be drafted. The topics will largely be shaped by the input we received from you, but our initial plan is to organize along three main topic areas, managing risk, cyber hygiene, and tools and metrics. This is because based on what we've heard already from our stakeholders in government and industry, these are the pieces that will be critical. How do we prepare for the evolving threat? What are the core practices that should be considered regardless of your organization and mission? And what are the tools and techniques to support those goals? As we do this analysis with industry, we will be looking both to existing standards and sector-specific guidance that already exist with an eye to working beyond the year envisioned by the executive order. In other words, we view this as being an ongoing process, a living document. So what are the principles that apply across sectors? What are the gaps that we will need to fill collaboratively with our partners in government and industry? How do we develop a process and a governance model to allow industry to continue to take leadership in this cybersecurity framework? These are the questions and more that we will be uh, exploring today in this event. Uh, we're going to hear from industry perspectives in our first panel, and you're going to hear from a set of information sharing and advisory centers, or ISACs, to discuss how various sectors see the threat space and how the framework can be used to support those threats. We will also hear from a group of organizations that have worked to develop a set of guidance for their sectors to discuss important considerations and lessons learned for the framework as well as what they think is truly applicable across sectors. And last, we'll present NIST and Department of Homeland Security staff to answer questions about the process going forward. So today is not going to be the uh, consensus reaching. This is about uh, the continuing the brainstorming and making sure that every good idea, every existing practice that uh, is germane to this is put on the table. And this is about getting organized for success. Uh, the success of this framework will rely on hearing from a wide range of diverse views and making sure we structure ourselves appropriately. The discussions today will help us get closer to our goal of empowering owners and operators of critical infrastructure and many others to make the best possible decisions in regards to identifying and preventing cybersecurity uh, attacks. So I want to thank all of you for making time today on rather short notice um, and agreeing to work with us on this effort. I'd like to now begin uh, to invite our first panel to start making their way up on to the, to the stage here and uh, take the, the middle four seats, I guess. Uh, first of all, uh, in the panel, I'll introduce them as they're coming up. Uh, Russell Schrader is the Chief Privacy Officer and Senior Associate General Counsel 
of Global Enterprise Risk for Visa, Incorporated. In that role, he's responsible for privacy, risk, and payment systems policies and issues at Visa. And he's the principal legal liaison for Visa financial institutions, attorneys on regulatory issues. Also uh, joining the panel is Terry Rice. Uh, Terry is the Associate Vice President of IT Risk Management and is the Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO, at Merck and Company. He's responsible for overseeing the company's information risk management program, including information policy development, identity management, data and system protection, technology compliance, e-discovery, and business continuity. Also joining the panel is uh, Michael Pepe. He's the Vice President of Information Security and Cyber Initiatives for Northrop Grumman's Information Systems Sector. In that role, he leads the company's cyber uh, strategy development uh, to advance the company's leadership role in the cybersecurity community. Dr. Pepe also serves as Northrop Grumman's Chief Information Security Officer, delivering Northrop Grumman's internal information security program. And rounding out the panel is uh, Reed Steffen. Uh, Reed is the Information Security Manager for St. Luke's Health System. It's the largest private employer in Idaho. It's comprised of nine hospitals and 130 clinics spread throughout southwestern Idaho and eastern Oregon. So you see from this panel, we're taking a cross-section of companies, and what we're hoping to learn about is the balance between good cybersecurity and good business. Because in my view, to be successful in this effort, it's going to take a convergence of those two. When good cybersecurity equals good business, that's when this is really going to take hold um, and, and blossom. So in order to frame this discussion with our partners, we want to acknowledge that the commercial businesses of America have their own business drivers, and cybersecurity is a critical supporting element. So we want to make sure that whatever is done through the executive order is also done in that context, a context that includes your individual architectures, the context that includes your technologies that you use in your companies, the threats that you face, and more importantly, the businesses that you're carrying out. Ensuring that those business drivers for implementing the framework are built, that are built in, is one of the important drivers up front that will be essential to this process. So the companies on this panel today uh, represent a wide range of missions. And we want to take away how cybersecurity is integrated into their business to support their needs, how cyber risk is balanced with business risk, and how they manage the investment in cybersecurity as a cost that, like all costs, must be understood, balanced, communicated, and managed. In the end, the businesses, like the ones on this panel, are the economic engines of our country. They are the ones that create jobs, generate prosperity and employment, and the cybersecurity effort uh, needs to be essential to their efforts um, and essential for it to be essential to our overall economy. The framework needs to follow, allow for business innovation. It needs to maintain and grow customer confidence, trust, and facilitate revenue, and fit with the strategic plans of these companies. So uh, I'm looking forward to this panel, and let me start by uh, introducing uh, Russell Schrader to start our discussion. Russell? Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. We're very pleased to be part of the conversation to talk about the public and private ways that we can work together on the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, we've seen some very good progress, starting with the executive order. It's a very sensible approach to uh, reflect information sharing, and we're very pleased, in addition, that such a uh, um, order includes some of the private sector feedback that we did see in the draft that came out a few weeks ago and then in the final order. And to build upon that as we go forward, we do think that any congressional action should address more international cooperation in fighting cybercrime, as well as liability protection for those people who are able to share and use the kinds of sensitive information that we hope will emerge from this public-private partnership. And we look forward very much to working with NIST, working with the administration, and working with Congress on these things. But there's so much more to be done uh, through partnerships like this. And to do that, I just wanted to lay out a little bit of how Visa approaches um, data security and cybersecurity general. As you know, it is of absolute critical importance to us. It's core to our brand promise to be the best way to pay and be paid. We also need to be the most secure way to pay and be paid. 
we have at the center of Visa our own uh, proprietary network, VisaNet, and we use cybersecurity all around that for each piece of the payments ecosystem. And we work with broader infrastructure and other industries in order to keep that particularly safe. Uh, you'll hear more about uh, later today the payment card industry, PCI, which Visa is a proud uh, member and co-founder, which was a long-term effort of a multi-stakeholder process. It involved financial institutions, merchants, processors, consumers, and has created a kind of multi-stakeholder approach and series of templates and guidelines that we think will be very useful to help banks, merchants, and consumers around the world. What's good about this is that not only is it multi-stakeholder, but it also continues to evolve as the nature of cybersecurity threats evolve and as innovation occurs in business. It also is scalable. It's something that has to be usable by small mom and pop stores, but also by international chains and large financial institutions. So I'll talk a little bit now just how Visa has done that. And basic to our approach is that we realize there is no silver bullet to cybersecurity. There is no point where you can check the box that says we are done with cybersecurity. So in order to embrace this kind of, uh, of approach, we've come up with a three-pronged one, which is prevent, protect, and respond. Now, to prevent, we try to stop the cybersecurity threat before it results in fraud. One of the tools we have is our strong neural network and products that we have developed, such as advanced authorization, which gives a real-time fraud risk score for every transaction that enters a VisaNet system. So we can identify, based on patterns, the potential likelihood that a particular transaction is fraudulent and issuers can act accordingly. In addition, for example, the EMV chip, which has been widely adopted throughout the world, is at last uh, gaining some traction in the United States, and we hope that technology does continue to move deeper into the U.S. The second one, protect, is that we are looking for ways to invest heavily in the infrastructure to promote consistent data security standards, such as the PCI DSS model. And finally, respond, which is if there is a breach within the Visa ecosystem, whether it's at a merchant or a processor, Visa will be right there working with that breached entity to figure out what has happened and the best way to solve the issue and make sure it doesn't happen again. But as we pointed out earlier today, uh, technology keeps moving, the threats keep evolving. We must always be looking ahead. So we have a fourth pillar in our security strategy, advance. The innovations are great, but if we can't rely on security, we really have not built something that's lasting. If consumers don't feel secure, if they don't feel the trust, they won't adopt the kind of innovations that are out there. So it is fundamental to a healthy payment system that brings benefits to all of the stakeholders in it. So what do these things that Visa has done play out in a public policy context, and what would we hope to see coming out of the multi-stakeholder uh, process and in the framework that comes out? Well, I think there's a, a few things that we hope people will keep in mind. The first, that one size doesn't fit all. We need things that will enhance rather than detract from operational goals of business. The second, to build on what already exists. We've seen tremendous uh, progress being made in public-private partnerships in other areas. The PCI standards that we've talked about are effective, and they are continuing to evolve. And so we think that if you can build on what is already out there to move forward, it would be a quicker, more effective way to act. Third, to aim for global scalability. One of the things we need to be careful about is to avoid confusing, duplicative, or even oppositional standards or requirements across geographies. In today's commerce, it's done on a global basis, on a second-by-second -second basis. And to comply with requirements in one country should not cause one to uh, run afoul of requirements in others, and to simplify and make efficient uses across geographies, for example, with Europe, would be particularly useful. 
A fourth, information sharing is very important. We think we need a clear and concise legal framework that helps both public and private sectors use appropriate sharing, but we also will need appropriate liability, antitrust, and freedom of information framework in order to work with those sharing issues. And finally, law enforcement. Uh, the work has, has been done in catching, identifying, and shutting down cyber criminals has been very gratifying. However, there's always more to hear and more to be done. We were gratified that the President is going to increase international cyber criminal enforcement, and we urge increased international cooperation in that regard, not just for the cyber criminal gangs, but also in discussions with those countries who harbor cyber crime rings. So thank you very much. Thank you, Russell. Why don't we just proceed in order? Uh, Michael, why don't you take the next? Uh... Great. Thanks, Dr. Gallagher. So uh, as Dr. Gallagher said, I'm Mike Pape. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Northrop Grumman, as well as the lead for our cyber business uh, looking external. So I've had the lead for our cyber external business uh, for a couple years now, but I recently picked up the role as Chief Information Security Officer about uh, six, eight months ago. And what I found is that that's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of how to balance the, the business against uh, the, the threat. You know, as a large aerospace and defense contractor, we're a little bit ahead of the rest of uh, the critical infrastructure industry. Uh, we've been working closely with the intelligence agencies, working closely with the DOD for several years on, on really working on, on cyber. And it's when, you, when you're doing cyber as a business, it's all great. You know, I've got somebody paying me to provide cybersecurity to protect their enterprise. Uh, when you ha actually have to look inside and say, okay, now I've got to figure out how much money I'm going to spend protecting the Northrop Grumman enterprise, that's where it becomes a little trickier. Now, I, now I've got to look at a balance of who do I report to, how often do I report up, how often do I let people know about incidents that are going on, what are we seeing outside of our realm and beyond, really, about where the next threats are coming from. So that's where I'm focusing lately, is on that risk balance of how to protect Northrop Grumman and how to be the best company we can and to ensure that the information that the government has entrusted us with is used carefully internally for appropriate measures. Now, the government has entrusted all of its aerospace and defense contractors over the past bunch of years with uh, critical information and we work closely together. As uh, Deputy Secretary Lute said, you know, this is about a collaborative approach. And what you'll find is that uh, I'm probably not representing Northrop Grumman solely up here. I'm representing all of my aerospace and defense brothers when we talk about, uh, you know, Boeing, Lockheed, Raytheon, General Dynamics. We all get together quite frequently and do a lot of information sharing. And really, that's the genesis of the information sharing initiatives that are going on right now is what's been going on in the defense industrial base for a while. We found that, that being very collaborative and being tight together on the technologies that we're implementing, the threats that we're looking at, helps us because this is not an area where we're necessarily competing against each other. We may uh, fight like cats and dogs on big projects and big uh, procurements that are out there in the DOD and in the intel world, but when it comes to protecting our own internal assets, we do it together. We do it collaboratively because I'm teamed closely with Lockheed Martin on a program over here. I'm teamed closely with Boeing on a program over here. And if my information security network is infiltrated, then it's likely that they're going to lose information as well because I'm carrying some of the key information that they've got. I think the critical infrastructure is going to find that that ecosystem of shared assets is very, very critical. Understand who is key carrying the key information that makes your business go. Understand that it's a network of the critical infrastructure all tied together and that the only way that you can get pure uh, satisfaction out of defending yourself is to make sure that your neighbors out there are doing the best job that they can as well. So I think that's going to be uh, an eye-opener for a lot of the critical infrastructure as, uh, as everybody moves forward. It's taken us a couple years to figure it out. Um, in order to balance that uh, risk of cyber with our business approach, uh, my role reports directly to the corporation, and I think the, 
you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a mix out there in the critical infrastructure, and you see it actually on this panel of uh, the types of people and the types of titles that they carry, whether it's chief security officer, chief information security officer, chief privacy officer. There's a, there's not a common lexicon and of roles and responsibilities of who do you report to and, and how do you go about determining. Uh, how much money you get to spend. You have your own budget. Does your budget fall under the CIO? Uh, do you have to compete with other IT resources out there inside the company? How much does your board understand about the uh, potential loss of intellectual property to a cyber attack? Those are the kind of things that, uh, that we've dealt with and I think we're moving along pretty rapidly and that we hope to feed back through the RFI process to NIST and really uh, be an active contributor along the way as you guys develop the framework. Um, so let's talk about a couple of things that we think are key. Uh, Russell did a great job of talking about uh, a few of them, so I won't repeat that. I hate being on these panels where I say, yeah, everything he said. So by the time it gets to you, Terry, you'll have to come up with something new. Um, so one of the things that are, it's really tough is that uh, figure of merit or benchmarking yourself against other people. If one size doesn't fit all and you can't go through a checklist from A to Z and say, hey, I'm done at the end, uh, I'm cyber secure, then where do you draw the line? How do you go, okay, I'm gonna go this far down the list of things that I need to do, but then I'm gonna run out of resources, I'm not gonna be able to go any further. Uh, it's those critical set of controls that you're gonna look at that are really important to balance. And, and you've gotta know enough about it to figure out how far do I go down that list before I get to the point where I say, that's, that's too much. And you know, part of the reason that we've been successful in the aerospace and defense world over the past bunch of years in, in working on cyber is that we're relying on things like the NIST 800-53 set of controls and the other critical controls that are out there in the industry that really give us a leg up. We look at them and say, yeah, that makes sense. I, I definitely need to do all that. I can't do everything in that list, but I've got to do what's appropriate for my business. So figuring out what's appropriate for your business and how to measure yourself and benchmark yourself against your peers is gonna be key. And uh, the last piece that I think is gonna be important in the building the framework is that uh, the importance of understanding that it's not just about protecting a perimeter. I can't just go out and say, okay, here's the edge of my Northrop Grumman Enterprise, nothing goes in or out without me saying so, and I'm good right there. Uh, it's about a building a layered defense. And when we talk about layered defense in the aerospace and defense world, sometimes we talk about it like a missile defense. And now I'm an aerospace engineer, so I'm a rocket scientist, so I like talking about missile defense. But in this case, we're talking about cyber layered defense. We're talking about protecting the perimeter. We're talking about protecting the network. We're talking about protecting the application. We're talking about protecting the database. And if you can't go all the way through that layered set and look at everything that you've got, then you're not gonna be able to identify where your biggest risks are. And so one of the things that we think that we're going to have to have in the framework is the, a layered defense approach, including getting down to looking at secure application development, secure code development. There's a lot of work being done in the industry, and there's a lot of interest in the DOD and a lot of interest right now in the government as well about how to develop secure applications. If you've got insecure applications but a really nice perimeter, uh, no go. Not, it's not gonna work for you because as soon as somebody gets either close inside or you've got an insider threat, then uh, you've got just as big a chance of information leaking out or having somebody prevent you from doing business the way you wanna accomplish it. So uh, we look forward to working with you guys and uh, we're here to help. Good morning, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this panel. I'm Reed Stephan, I lead the information security program at St. Luke's Health System. Prior to, to that role, I spent nearly a decade at Hewlett Packard. It was an eye-opening experience to join the healthcare industry and to recognize that we are a few years behind other industries in terms of our general security posture. In an effort to expedite and try and accelerate our security our maturity at St. Luke's, I looked to try and leverage and adopt existing frameworks and capabilities. Um, I had some understanding of the Information Sharing and Assurance Center, so I, one of the first things I did was I pursued membership in the National Health ISAC. That's been a great partnership. It's been a vital source of, of information and guidance for us. 
We also looked to other existing standards and methodologies that we could adopt and leverage to help us implement a, a baseline level of security foundational capabilities. For example, the NIST 800-30 guide for risk assessments was a key guide for us as we tried to develop a, an internal risk assessment approach that we used to, to meet the need that we had to conduct risk assessments to support meaningful use attestation. Uh, this is one example of many of being able to leverage existing support collateral that's out there in an effort to fast track and accelerate maturing and developing a, an, an information security program. The, the bottom line for me is that an adopt and go approach, even though you have to tailor it to fit your environment, is much more advantageous than trying to build something from scratch. And that's, from my perspective, that's the inherent value in the cybersecurity framework and its underlying standards, processes, procedures, and methodologies. One of the challenges we face is trying to find the right balance and integration between cybersecurity risk management and business risk management. If these are treated as mutually exclusive efforts, often there'll be conflict and there'll be stalemates that ensue. But if you can establish an integrated collaborative approach to both of those, you then create synergy and momentum. The framework, if it can help to foster this kind of integration and this understanding that cyber risk management and business risk management are complementary, that would be invaluable. It has to be a framework that is not just a, is something that's understood by cybersecurity professionals and used by those professionals. It has to be accessible and comprehensible to the business. Um, it also needs to support a risk-based approach rather than a control-based approach. A risk-based approach would create a natural pathway to collaboration between the business and IT. That, that collaboration then generates a sense of partnership and a sense of vested ownership that's essential for the success of any information security program. I find that a security framework like this has to have a lean forward security mindset, meaning that organizations need to have a mindset that, that they at any given point in time that a targeted, sophisticated attack has successfully penetrated them, and that they need to have a, a consistent approach and process in place to be monitoring to try and detect those successful attacks prior to any evidence or any signs of compromise or damage. That's just the world that we live in. One of the challenges that I think slows down the enhancement of cybersecurity in our world today is that we have a lack of robust inter- and cross-industry collaboration. Now, there is collaboration that occurs. There's groups such as ISAC and other methods that try and facilitate and foster this. But it's not, what I find is that consistent, meaningful collaboration is still far too isolated to individual and specialized groups. We need to have collaboration take a, <clears throat> a firm toehold and to be a core tenant in any, um, any mature cybersecurity program. And the framework, I believe, needs to address this and try and facilitate <clears throat> this type of collaboration. Uh, finally, I would say that <clears throat> the cybersecurity framework needs to be designed with a mindset that it will never be truly complete. It needs to be dynamic and evolving understanding that as our experience, as our use of it, as emerging best practices are refined or developed, it needs to incorporate those and not collapse under its own weight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Terry Rice, and I'm the uh, Chief Information Security Officer at Merck, a large pharmaceutical uh, uh, company. Um, I've had the pleasure of experiencing both being on the government side um, in the military and then working in the DIB as a, uh, a consultant 
prior to moving into the healthcare industry. So I've seen some common issues as well as some common problems across all of those sectors. Um, I want to thank uh, the Department of Commerce and NIST for putting on this workshop. All have been uh, tremendous partners in dealing with the challenge of cybersecurity thus far. The topic is difficult, and there are rarely easy answers, but I think it's the public-private discourse um, that takes place in sessions like this that are going to provide the opportunities for us to uh, get a handle and move forward in addressing this problem. I work in an industry now that spends $67 billion on leading-edge medical research on an annual basis and directly employs over 650,000 uh, people. But most importantly, we're part of an industry that creates medicines and vaccines that save a huge number of lives and help an even larger number of people live better and healthier lives each and every year. And it's because of this last fact that the life sciences industry has been labeled as part of the critical infrastructure under the uh, previous HSPD-7. Specifically, we're part of the healthcare and public health sector. And so we are already working very closely with uh, the Department of Homeland Security, um, HHS, and specifically through the Sector Coordinating Council on a myriad of critical infrastructure protection issues to include uh, the cyber domain. But we at Merck and many of our peers are also manufacturers of consumer goods and consumer products where the margins are very different uh, than the pharmaceutical domain. And we're not, those pieces are not part of the critical infrastructure. So one of the challenges and one of the worries that we have is uh, restrictive requirements that get implemented across a company or an organization that could impede uh, the growth and provide a significant burden on those other portions that are not connected uh, to the critical infrastructure. Um, in preparation for this, uh, this discussion, I went back and reviewed the EO and uh, looked at the NIST RFI and the, uh, the notice of inquiry that came out on cybersecurity framework and the incentives. So I'd like to take a moment to share a few thoughts um, that might prompt some discussion during the, uh, the, the, the open dialogue uh, portion. Uh, the first section of the RFI actually talked about risk management practices within the companies and asked a series of questions. At Merck, like any large um, entity, uh, we have an enterprise risk management program that looks at what are the top 10 to 12 risks that impact our uh, corporate strategy. And we measure those risks both in terms of likelihoods and impact, where impact is both the financial aspect as well as the reputational impact to our companies moving, moving forward. Um, and, and typically we'll see issues like the global macroeconomic environment, uh, supply chain issues and so forth rise up, but cybersecurity has now become an integral part of that discussion and uh, 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 those, those risks. Um, but one of the problems that we struggle with is, and, and it was alluded to briefly, um, was what's the measure of success? Security is not a binary. It's not you're secure, you're not secure. And so we struggle um, to determine precisely where we should be making investments. And it's not just within IT. It's also within, if I have a dollar, do I spend it on research on Alzheimer's um, or cancer or some other affliction, or do I spend it on pr uh, protecting my information um, and, and, and systems? And I think part of the discourse and hopefully part of the cybersecurity framework will be to look at metrics where we can benchmark, where we can measure ourselves. And I'm not talking about the thousands of metrics that we have at the tactical level today. I get reams of paperwork on a weekly basis of all of the different metrics on, on system performance and events that we've blocked and so forth. But how do those chain together to answer questions about risk that will allow us to make those decisions about where we make our investments uh, moving forward. In fact, I would submit that the, the uh, challenge that we're having in the uh, cyber insurance market today, which although it's addressed the PII issue, um, it really hasn't gone after the intellectual property and some of the other issues related to availability, is due to the lack of effective metrics where those companies can make adequate risk-based decisions about what they're going to back and what they're not going to back in terms of uh, um, um, uh, risk. So I think NIST is in a very, very good position to be able to help spur innovation in this area and uh, address this topic as, uh, uh, cyber, in the cybersecurity framework. The third section of the RFI raised the issue of uh, specific practices that were in, uh, used across industry or within a specific sector. So I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about an innovative approach that we've applied within the pharma industry surrounding the issue of digital identities, an approach that's now actually starting to gain traction in other parts of the healthcare. 
Uh, for any of you that have spent time around the pharmaceutical industry, you'll know that the process to bring a new molecular compound from research in the lab to approval through the FDA can take more than a decade. And during that process, tens of thousands of pages and documents are created, uh, which get submitted as part of the new drug approval uh, uh, package. And until very recently, very recently, a lot of that was done in paper. We'd literally back up tractor trailers to the FDA and deliver boxes of documentation, and they would go through the approval process. And you can imagine, very inefficient for us and highly inefficient for the, uh, uh, for, for the government to be able to search and, and, and uh, quickly go through and look at the safety and efficacy of those uh, medications. Um, so we actually set up in 2005 the pharmaceutical industry, the key leaders in that, set up a not-for-profit association to develop and implement a voluntary digital identity standard across the life sciences industry. The association was and is governed by members from each of the participating companies and it employs a very small staff, mainly to focus on uh, marketing, innovation, and the implementation details. We also work very, very closely through the association with the FDA, with NIST, the Federal PKI Steering Committee, and more recently, uh, the NSTIC organization, um, to make sure that the Safe Biopharma standard stays aligned uh, with these other government uh, standards. The initial goal of that standard, Safe Biopharma, was for doctors, researchers, and pharmaceutical uh, employees to use identities to digitally sign uh, those electronic documents using LOA3 hardware, uh, medium assurance hardware, uh, PKI credentials. Um, and it was designed in order to ensure the authenticity and non-repudiation of information as it moved from organization from a doctor's office to a contract research organization to the uh, pharmaceutical company and then on. Um, and uh, fortunately, we had the foresight to understand that each pharmaceutical uh, credential, or each farmer that would credential a doctor with whom they work, if, if each of us did every doctor with whom we worked, those doctors would end up with a necklace of uh, tokens um, on that. So what we had to do was to create a trust framework uh, and work out the legal liabilities between the pharma companies that would ultimately allow one company such as Merck to issue credential to a doctor and then have that trusted by another company uh, that is part of, part of the association. So we align very closely to the NIST 800-63 guidelines. Uh, we align to the FIPS um, uh, guidelines. And today we have a fully operational standard that is being utilized throughout the pharmaceutical industry and increasingly in other parts of the healthcare industry. For example, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency uh, a couple of years ago specified the requirements for digitally signing electronic prescription for controlled substances. On day one of that regulation going into effect, Safe Biopharma met the standards uh, for those uh, e-scripts. The Safe Biopharma uh, PKI bridge is also cross-certified with the federal bridge, which in layman's terms means that the digital identities that are issued by Safe Biopharma are equivalent to the PIV cards that are issued by the federal government um, and, 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 and vice, vice uh, versa. And that's also um, uh, cross-certified uh, with the um, CERTIPATH in the, in, in the DIB. So there's mechanisms for trust uh, between that. The standard has also, on the topic of international, the standard has also been accepted by the European Medicines Agency and the Japanese Pharmaceutical uh, Manufacturing Agency, and we're working to facilitate electronic uh, submissions in those areas. But in my opinion, the greatest benefits for the use of that voluntary industry standard is for federated authentication. Um, the same identities that have been used for digital signatures on those documents can easily be used um, for authentication purposes. And we're in the midst of conducting some pilots with a number of government uh, organizations and across the pharmaceutical industry. And in fact, one pharma company has already um, uh, utilized those identities uh, for multi-factor authentication of their 100,000 employees. Um, while SAFE fills a compelling need uh, for the industry, there's a lot of work that still, still needs to be done there. And the reason I bring it up is because I think that uh, not so much the specifics of identity, but this, the general approach, the use of an association, the use of voluntary standards, trying to use those in an international form provides a good framework that could be utilized um, in other areas of cybersecurity. But it's not the panacea in identity even. Uh, we have need for federated um, access control methodologies now that authentication has been worked out with work like SAML and the um, OAuth standards. Uh, we need machine-to-machine -machine authentication. That's become an increasingly critical issue in the healthcare industry where we have devices talking to devices, and that's only going to proliferate immensely in the next five to ten years. Um, 
And we also, interestingly enough, have a need for um, anonymity. Um, so we have patients, patient demand, that they want to go to trusted sources to be able to do research on information about afflictions and ailments and so forth, trusted, trusted uh, entities, and they don't want to be giving up identity information, um, uh, particularly when it's dealing with afflictions that may have a social stigma attached to those. So how do you guarantee anonymity at the same time as having strong identity for the areas that you need that uh, trust? Beyond Safe Biopharma, a couple of other points. Uh, information sharing, we absolutely need a better mechanism for getting actionable intelligence into our companies. Um, and, and I think the ISAC uh, uh, mechanisms are the right approach for that. Uh, I know the FS ISAC has really led the way and, and blazing a trail there. And a lot of the other ISACs, which we'll hear about this afternoon, have been uh, working to follow suit. But I definitely think it's the right mechanism, and especially when you start dealing with the issues of who gets clearances and, and, and so forth. Not mentioned in the EO or in the, um, um, in the NOI or, or the RFI is the issue of skilled uh, workers. And um, even if we get the standards right and we get the technology right, if we don't have a large pool of skilled workers uh, to be able to implement those processes and standards, uh, we're going to have some trouble. And there's some disturbing stats that we've seen recently. Um, I saw one uh, that indicated that only a handful of colleges that are issuing bachelor's degrees in computer sciences actually require their students to take a uh, computer security course. Um, and I know NIST has been working on the NICE standards and uh, made some great progress there, but I think there's a long way to go, and maybe there's some work that could be done in that framework there. Um, I'm going to take one uh, a slight twist on the international issues that have already been mentioned. How does the security, uh, cybersecurity framework apply to multinational corporations that are operating in multiple, multiple jurisdictions? And what happens if we have a non-U.S. company owning and operating critical infrastructure how do they share? And I've asked the questions, and there hasn't been a good dialogue or response uh, uh, to that. And there's a begin, has there been any, um, any consideration for the potential negative consequences that could come from intelligence sharing? And, and you think about the APT threat and so forth, and you think about foreign companies that are sharing information with their intelligence organizations, um, that might cause a, a problem in the U.S. And, and by the same token, those of us that are selling in international markets, it could cause a concern in, in, in moving into some of those. And the final thoughts, I'm really happy that the EO covered um, the issue of privacy. Uh, privacy has to be a major focus throughout this. Um, we can win the battle potentially on the cybersecurity front, but lose the war in giving up uh, civil liberties and uh, privacy protections as we use this great thing called the Internet. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. So uh, we have uh, about 45 minutes for discussion, but I'm going to sort of promise not to use all of that. I realize we barely scheduled enough time for lunch, but I, I do think there's some uh, discussion we'd like to have here. And one of the first questions that I wanted to ask the panel, I'm going to ask the whole panel to comment on this, um, and Terry brought it up very nicely in his, in his uh, remarks. You know, we talk about a framework as a set of standards, practices, policies. We've talked about a lot of the guidance that's out there right now, which tends to be highly tunable. It's a very rich toolbox, and you have to select from that. So one of the real questions that comes up right away is, uh, how do we uh, support adoption? Because in the end, as we've heard, uh, a lot of the attacks that happen are, we know how to solve those. It's, it was a failure to execute, not a failure of understanding how to execute. And so from your own perspective, talk about how in your industry or in your company, you promote uh, the adoption side of this. And, and what part, you know, how should the framework uh, be thinking about supporting adoption, whether that's the skilled workforce or whether that's as supporting technology or what have you. I stumped them already. Uh, okay, here we go. I'll go first. So uh, I, I think the first thing you have to do when you consider a widespread adoption within a company is to realize that in today's day and age, uh, at least the type of threats we're seeing a lot of today, the, the first line of defense is every employee in the company. And every employee in the company has to understand that that email that looks like it's coming from somebody that uh, looks like a funny joke or uh, looks like a nice zip file that you can download and execute on your computer might not actually be from somebody that you know. And uh, 
So in order to ensure that, that people are willing to adopt and willing to think about this, you have to train everybody in the company that it's not just about the folks over there in information security that are dealing with this, it's everybody's job to consider the risk to the company when they click on that link, when they open that email. So at Northrop Grumman, one of the things we do in my organization is we spearfish our own employees. So that's a lot of fun, let me tell you that. Uh, so last week, while I was on vacation in the sunny Caribbean, I sent out an email to 68,000 Northrop Grumman employees that was a spear phishing attack. And uh, if they do it right and they report it to my cybersecurity operations center, then they get a nice thank you email from me that says, hey, good job, uh, that's a way to, way to pay attention and a way to understand what's going on and think about it. And if they do it wrong and they click on the email that says, hey, your 2012 taxes need adjusting before you file, uh, which is what the subject of the spear phishing email was, uh, then they get the nice remedial training. Uh, no, no, you did it wrong. Here's what you should have done. Here's how to recognize all the signs that this was a spear phishing attempt. And, and I think to get widespread adoption, it starts at the core of the company, of the people that are there. It's not just about the information security team. Yeah, I'll just, <clears throat> I'll, I'll pick up on that thread. I agree with what Michael said. Um, you know, I think of the tenant that you hear that good compliance does not equate necessarily to good security. You can be compliant and not secure. But if you have good security, a byproduct is compliance. If, if your focus with your awareness training and your approach is being compliant, that creates a mentality of we have to do this, we're being compelled to do this. <clears throat> but if you can paint the context of why it's meaningful to the employee and you get them to buy in because they want to do it, because security is something that's pervasive in all of our lives. And if you can frame the discussion from the standpoint of, of how that's adding value to what they're doing in the business, to what they're doing in their own personal life, then we've seen in healthcare that we have broader adoption. And we have some tough users. Typically doctors, their, their initial response to any kind of security mandated control is, this is going to affect how I deliver patient care. So we have to tread very carefully about how we, how we approach things that we want to do. And we have to facilitate and foster a collaborative um, environment where they buy in <clears throat> to the security controls and processes that we're trying to implement. But if you get that individual user buy-in, I agree with Michael, is that that is the last line of defense, <clears throat> and also that is the weakest link in most organizations, so it's essential. I think that's right. The uh, personal, making it personal um, is, is very important, too. Uh, when we do training, we do point out that uh, many people have gotten calls from um, a card issuer, did you make this charge, or have been asked for additional piece of information or asked to talk to uh, someone when they check out to see whether their, their card has been lost or stolen. Uh, people who have experienced identity theft also are very keen to help others from not uh, experiencing the same kind of trauma that they went through, even with uh, Visa Zero Liability Policy. So we do try to make sure that they understand how this is helping them as people and as employees and as uh, people who are delivering uh, needed financial services uh, throughout all the customers in the payment ecosystem. Russell, let me ask a follow-up before we turn to Terry. So uh, we've heard a lot about the integration as a key, you know, a key step in, in, in promoting adoption. But Visa runs an ecosystem, mm -hmm. and you've got uh, payment uh, service centers, and you've got merchants, um, and yet you really uh, sort of own the brand uh, if there's a problem, even if it's in a merchant or in a payment center with, if, if there's a major cybersecurity breach. So how does Visa look and work with, in fact, you have to help uh, in a response situation, as you pointed mm -hmm. out in your remarks. So how do you look at um, the behavior or, or support adoption of good cybersecurity from, let's say, a merchant or from uh, a payment service center? Sure. Well, it's important that everyone sort of um, gets... Um, the importance of, of security because each at the end of the day it's about a consumer making a choice to use uh, to use your product uh, we compete with at every point of uh, sale every day chances are in your wallet we hope you have a visa card you may have another card from another brand you may have cash uh, you may have a check you may have an app on your phone that lets you buy that latte 
uh, and what we want is for you to pay with your Visa card. And if the consumer doesn't feel comfortable, if it doesn't trust the brand, doesn't trust the security of it, then they may choose to use one of those other forms of payment. The merchant gets that as well. The merchant doesn't want to have the, either the bad press or in the largest cases the FTC consent decree or other impacts to their business for having a large security breach. So there are ongoing uh, sticks out there, but there is a carrot of how do I make a seamless, happy customer experience every step of the way. So we find that most of them are looking for help, but they're looking for the kind of help that they can implement, something that's scalable to a mom and pop as well as to an international financial institution or, or uh, chain of stores. So, Terry, I guess the same to you. I, you talked a little bit about uh, some of technologies that are being used across the pharmaceutical industry. How does that sector sort of promote adoption of these, uh, these approaches? Um, so I, I think fundamentally we, we look at our business processes um, and, and have a very clear understanding of how those business processes operate and the information that is related um, uh, to those processes. And then what are the specific risks that are associated with the failure of the process, the release of the information. Um, and just to give you a, a more concrete example, um, we are divided into a sales organization, a manufacturing organization, and a research organization. Um, the risks in the research organization are very much around confidentiality of the intellectual property that we produce with the, uh, the, the tremendous investment we make on research and development. In the manufacturing area, availability and compliance to the regulatory guidelines that have been uh, put out by the FDA is a very, very critical uh, focus for them. And in the sales arena, there's a whole bunch of other issues about enablement and, and, and the use of new technology um, um, that they, that they so, so desire. But they're all connected to the same, the same network fabric. And so how do you go about putting in the mechanisms in place? And I'll submit the, the, one, of the, one of the benefits that we've had, and I know a lot of my peers have implemented similar practices, is by using enterprise risk management capabilities where you get together with your peers that may be dealing with supply chain risk or may be dealing with um, compliance risk or may be dealing with other, other types of risk. And when you start to have discourse on what those risks are to those specific areas, what you find is a lot of times um, you can make the connection. So in the supply chain arena, loss of availability, I can start to talk about, not about the cyber incidents that are going to occur, but how failures in our IT systems, irrespective of the cause, could lead to um, issues and incidents there. So it's that patchwork and uh, cross-connect between different risk managers within the business and within IT that I think starts to give them the line of sight, in addition to all of the uh, education and awareness stuff that uh, my colleagues were talking about. That's great. So the other question I wanted to ask the panel is, uh, you all uh, characterized to some level um, the efforts not just by your company, but by your sector, if you will, by your business community. And uh, the framework, one of the interesting things about the framework is the enormous breadth of companies and, and uh, interests that it will encompass. So the question comes up, what's common and what's not common? In other words, in, in putting together this framework, what is the space that should be covered that really spans these very diverse set of companies and which ones uh, should be basically left to be tackled by more like Organizations. How do how do you think about that uh, from a benefit that might come from this this very broad effort? So I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think in the identity space um, is one that is ripe um, for for work across industry sectors, and we've actually seen um, through mechanisms like the federal PKI bridge that different industries, um, not, not just the DIB, um, there's also the education uh, through REBCA that is cross-certified, that those entities have all agreed to the frameworks um, that have been put out through NIST um, and the different LOA levels, um, and then they can take that and then use it and tailor it into their environments. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there to, t uh, specifically in the identity arena, uh, to create even greater standards and um, yeah. I guess I'm struggling with trying to come up with an area that we wouldn't um, all have a common vested interest in. Um, one of my colleagues in their comments kind of referred to the, the symbiotic relationship that we share 
right? What happens to one affects all. So conversely, as security improves in one, it lifts the tide for everyone else. Um, one area that is a constant plague to healthcare is, and this is something that's really indefensible, but just the continued lack of data encryption. I mean, a day does not go by that you don't hear of some breach, typically a lost or stolen asset that wasn't encrypted that contains sensitive patient data. So, so one area from my perspective that impacts all of us and that's essential is safeguards around data, whether in storage or in transit, to make sure that it can only be viewed and accessed by those who have the right to do so. And another, of course, is law enforcement on an international basis, that kind of uh, cooperation and continued apprehension and prosecution, as well as ongoing dialogue with uh, states that are, are harboring um, cyber criminals. So I think there's a lot of commonality that you see when you look across the different sectors of the critical infrastructure in terms of the types of threats that, that each one of us face. And being a part of the critical infrastructure like we are doesn't necessarily mean that I see the same types of threats that Russell sees. You know, in the, in the financial services sector, uh, when you get the distributed denial of service attack that cripples the business's ability to do uh, transactions over the web is not something that's common across each one of the industries. You know, if somebody did a DDoS attack on the North of Grumman website, I might not notice for a couple weeks because it's not the way I do business. I don't do business with my customers through that forward-facing website. So I think you've got to look at it from a perspective of uh, what are the common types of threat vectors that you see, what are the common vulnerabilities that the enterprises have, and that's where you're going to find your commonality. But, but I'd caution you guys that when you're doing that, don't make up something new. You know, if you find something that, like identity, like Terry talked about, that, that's common across the industries now, and there's common standards out there, uh, go find it, say, we're going to point at that, and, and don't work much harder on that, because there's been a lot of work in that area already. It doesn't mean you guys have to reinvent something new. Well, that's welcome advice to us. I don't think we want to reinvent any wheels ourselves. So, uh, so let me, uh, what I heard was actually quite interesting, that uh, because you know, one of the most frequent comments that was in your initial statements was the desire and need to be able to tune and manage risk directly in the context of the business you're operating. And yet, in the follow-up question, there was a sense that yet the infrastructure that's being used here is actually quite common. Um, we're all looking at identity management, we're all looking at data security, you're all looking at uh, uh, network security, you're all looking at uh, law enforcement and some of the response capabilities. Um, so maybe the common area is, this, is when we focus on the common shared infrastructure, but the actual details are, are where the, uh, the, uh, the tuning takes place for each specific sector. Yeah, so there's a couple of things you can do, and you, you, we talked a little bit about in your opening remarks about innovation and driving the industry forward. And I think there's been a lot of work in that area that follows on directly from the identity piece. You know, you can, you can talk about once I've got uh, an understanding of the identity of who it is that's behind the information and who developed the intellectual property associated with it, I can do some pretty cool technologies like uh, data loss prevention and uh, digital rights management, which I have tightly integrated inside my own organization. So if somebody tries to send a document that they've created that is Northrop Grumman proprietary information outside of my enterprise, I block it, I kick it back to them, I say, hey, did you really want to do that? You might be exposing the company information. And so I can do that with a combination of, of pretty cool technologies that are out there but integrating those together and figuring out what's important is, is going to be really different by industry. You know, does each doctor really want to uh, transmit the public's uh, health records to their home computer because he wants to go home at the end of the day and I'll just work on it later? You know, my, my system isn't really well set up, so I'll just I'll send it home and, uh, and then I'll work on it there. That's, uh, you, don't, you don't want that, right? I think one of the other areas that would be helpful is, is around metrics. Um, and, and, and again, the, the tactical metrics, I think there's tons of them, but it's the chaining and being able to express that in terms, in ter in terms of risk, that there may be some commonalities uh, throughout, throughout industry in that, in that uh, metrics uh, development process. So let me talk a little bit about risk. And specifically, I want to talk about your bosses. 
Uh, we talked about the need to integrate um, cybersecurity with business practice. You all touched on that. Um, it can be a bolt-on. It has to be really highly integrated. And one of the other things we heard is that uh, it's through the application of risk management that that distinguishing that, you know, where what you do in a financial service makes more sense versus what you might do in a defense uh, company, healthcare company, and so forth. So uh, the role of risk management starts to look very important to me um, because that's one of the places where this, uh, this dialing in takes place, where it becomes specific and uh, drawn into um, practice. And now the question comes, if I'm a CEO and uh, I come from a very different kinds of companies, um, it sounds like risk management may be one of the things that uh, they would pay attention to because that's a common business practice. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, how do you make cybersecurity relevant in the C-suite to the business the leaders of the company? And is there an approach that could, in fact, from a business perspective, be common across such a diverse set of companies as well? I think the most obvious first one is that, um, you know, look at the daily paper. I mean, there's constantly uh, the, uh, the news coverage uh, speaks for itself to a large extent. You really can't be running a large company without being aware that there are intellectual property thefts, there are cybersecurity rings out there, that there is uh, a lot of concern on the government side of, um, of loss of, of um, intellectual assets as well as consumer trust. So it, it starts out being just that simple. Um, the other part is that it's not that you can avoid all risk. Uh, there is certain risk appetites, but you need to know and understand what is the degree of risk you're actually taking so that you're making an intelligent decision, as you mentioned earlier, as to where someone might draw the line on the must-do and, and, uh, and the nice to do. So I think that certainly in our business that education piece is, is completely unnecessary. I'm happy to say because of uh, the trust that people uh, put in Visa and the importance that we have uh, on trust in the brand that caused us to lead you know, and found with others uh, the PCI network to disseminate that throughout the entire ecosystem. I think what is common across our industries is that you can't take a, a fear-based approach to your executive suite. You can't try and always present the worst-case scenario because that will not play out very well over the long term. So I think that as what, what's not acceptable from my perspective is when blind risk is just undertaken by the business because it's not documented, it's not conveyed, and the wrong decision is made because the decision makers aren't aware of the risk. So what I found works is to to have a consistent process in place to allow you to measure, capture, and convey risk. Um, and it's not always that we can't live with the risk, just like you say. I mean, there's, there's a balance there. You can, you can eliminate it. You can also mitigate it. You may choose to accept it. But once you establish that dialogue and you're viewed as a partner, not someone that's always trying to get the risk down to zero, but just trying to make sure that the business is aware of the risk, and operating within the confines and understanding of what that risk is, then that gets you a seat at the table, and it makes it much easier in the future to have those ongoing discussions. We, we, we've uh, focused a lot of effort on, on at least loosely aligning to different standards, capabilities that are out there. So the ISO 27000 series is used mainly with internal to my, my organization. Um, on how we address risk, IT security risk specifically. We also have a loose affiliation with the COBIT standards um, on broader risk topics across IT, so including program and project risk um, and the ability to execute and meet schedule and so forth. And then at the enterprise level, there's a loose affiliation with uh, the COSO standards um, and the ability to align to that and have some common vernacular across those different areas of the business that are dealing with uh, risk management topics. I think in the aerospace and defense sector, we've got it uh, easy. You know, our CEOs, our C-suite really understand cybersecurity because it's a key part of a lot of our business. And when we talk about uh, delivering airplanes and unmanned vehicles and ships and tanks and ground vehicles and things like that, um, we have a, a somewhat educated customer who understands that a part of the balance of that equation is 
uh, capability of the platform versus the embedded security on board the platform. Um, our CEOs get that. You know, they understand that if I want to deliver capability, it has to be delivered securely, and therefore I have to understand the cyber implications of anything I do. They understand that internally as well, but that doesn't mean that they have a, a, a cut and dried objective measure, a figure of merit, that they can say, here's how much I need to spend on my internal cyber and my own protection of my enterprise. Uh, those don't exist. You know, you can look at benchmarking. You can. There's a couple of uh, corporations out there that do benchmarking around the industry, and I can look at that and say, "Wow, I'm killing it! Great, I'm benchmarked. I'm way up at the high end. Uh, I don't want to go to the CEO and say, hey, look, we're all the way up at the top end. We can spend less.' Um, th there isn't anything out there that'll tell you, here's how you balance that risk. I think it's about uh, getting the right people in the information security piece of your business and trusting them to do the job, trusting them to look ahead, figure out where the next threat's coming from, and be uh, responsive and proactive. But you, I don't think you're going to find that one, as uh, Russell said, uh, one silver bullet that says, I'm secure. That's great. I can see now why the risk management has been one of the consensus areas that really is a centerpiece for the framework. Let me talk a little bit about the framework and then ask you a follow-up question. So. Uh, in the United States, standard setting is not a government activity. Uh, in fact, uh, the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act tells the government to look to private sector for its standards needs. So the framework shouldn't really be thought of as a new set of standards. It should be, th we're all IT people, it should be thought of as a pointer uh, to basically existing standards that are developed in an industry specific way. Um, and that raises some interesting options. In other words, how can we ex exploit the fact that we're working together on a set of standards that we're all going to recognize? Um, and I wanted you to, to comment on that. Russell, you made a comment early on in your, uh, in your opening remarks about how in the payment services industry you were even using this to drive adoption of specific technologies. You talked about the certain chips and so forth. Um, and so. Uh, comment, if you will, on, on the role of this common shared set of standards as a way of uh, maybe creating leverage. In other words, this broad community that's using this can use leverage to uh, drive innovation, uh, can promote uh, new technologies, and uh, basically make the market work for you as you try to improve cybersecurity. Yeah, sure. Uh, the standards are um, evolve every few years, basically a group of uh, banks, brands, technology people, merchants, processors get together and say, what do they see as the coming threats? And you'll hear more about that later. And come up with proposals which are then vetted and then adopted. And also some lists come up of uh, how you would look at a, a, an assessor, how you would look at people do for forensics and things. But they try to look ahead and it's always difficult to be looking far ahead because it takes a while for everything to catch up. But when you're looking at cyber threats, the cyber threats may not be just at uh, payments. It may be for uh, personal information at universities, maybe for health information at hospitals, health information at pharmaceutical developments. So there are ways to take these types of approaches and share them across industries. Other industries may not have been paying as close attention to the kind of standards elsewhere, uh, but there is, um, if you're not willing to, uh, to invent and if you're willing to say somebody may have had a good idea or even a better idea, uh, take it, borrow it, and, and adapt it. Uh, so that's part of the flexibility of it. So if people are not directly involved in payments, they may not have gone through all of the standards and have the aha moment or say that here's something that we can transfer over. So uh, we just encourage people to uh, take what they need, uh, to, to adopt it, to see if they want to feed back in something. And we hope that the dialogue works uh, across industries. It also works from government and it also works on an international level. But we always need to have that kind of flexibility. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that uh, the government sometimes and on the state levels think about taking standards and putting them and codifying them. And we've always said that's not quite what you want to do because you don't want to have the absolute best standards of 1985 on the books and they just become very difficult to update and to become relevant as things change. So that's why we urge this kind of ongoing flexibility and ability to look into the future. 
I think there's also opportunity for amortization of cost um, when you have standards and you know safe biopharma as I mentioned is an association where we've we've done that and there's actually we've developed tools to show the ROI um, on using the shared framework but you also have to be careful in those mechanisms uh, for antitrust issues and so forth um, so that you can still continue to develop and allow small players uh, to innovate so we actually have created a vendor partner mechanism that allows both small and large entities to participate and influence um, the development of the standards while at the same time the governance and the approval is the board members from the pharmaceutical industry that are sitting on that, that association. I think one of the biggest things you're going to find is the how to sort of uh, get everybody to think about the standard and how it ap applies to them uh, across the board so that people are comfortable doing business with each other. You know, in the aerospace and defense uh, community, there's a, there's a hierarchy of tier one integrators, and then there's uh, your, your tier two suppliers, and then there's your, your tier three vendors. And up and down that chain, we've been doing business with each other for a long, long time based on trust. And, um, and, and that trust comes from personal relationships of I know how they do business, and so I, I work with them as a trusted partner, and I go off and I, I build stuff with them, and I freely share information with them knowing that they're not going to give, give it away to somebody. Um, that's getting harder and harder to do. You know, when you talk about securing the supply chain, you talk about securing the, the set of vendors that we go out and use, that's a really challenging issue. And, and how to get that entire supply chain from the, in your lingo, the mom and pop store, uh, the, the 10 person industry who has the coolest technology that I want to implement on my next unmanned vehicle, uh, they may not have the millions of dollars necessary to secure their infrastructure and to, to, keep it, to keep it to themselves. And so if our adversaries are off trying to attack the tier one integrators and they realize that, wow, those guys are, are really up on their game, they know uh, where the threats are coming from and they're defeating them every single time, they're just going to move down the chain and they're going to try it at tier two. And if they can't get in there, they're going to go down to tier three and they're going to try and get in there. And they're going to keep doing that and they're going to keep looking for ways to get in and exploiting vulnerabilities until they find the easiest path. So our job when we develop standards is to develop standards that people can look at and, and think about complying with to make it as hard as possible for the adversary to get the information they want. So that's uh, that's really important, I think, uh, because the you know the framework itself, as I said, uh, is basically going to be a collection of probably references to existing standards. Um, by the way, it can be more than one in a given area. Uh, the U.S. standards uh, process is wonderfully competitive. We often have a lot of uh, options there, and that's there's no reason we have to walk away from that. Uh, but what, I heard two important things here. One is the role of innovation and change. We don't want, this is too dynamic of a technology to have static references to fixed standards. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what you really need to have is some process for uh, pointing to, you know, uh, an ongoing process in a, in a careful way. Um, and the other part of this is, the, is supporting adoption within your supply chains and across the system, and that's going to be very important. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask one other question about the international aspect, but I see we have an audience that's uh, questions. So let's go ahead and take that. Sure. Um, my name is Chris Blask. I'm the chair of the Industrial Control System, ISAC. And I, I think you guys are, are showing an example of really what we can do, and in some ways what we can. And I'm interested in your comments on that. You know, our focus is our, our belief in response to the RFI is that what we really can do is national situational awareness and where it is critical to work on identity and uh, data in transit, data in rest and encryption and, and these other individual issues. But as Michael was saying a, a moment ago as well, you know, we have such a broad range of, of entities and even where you have unlimited resources effectively, you know, as you may at, at uh, Northrop Grumman, um, you can't really tell where to stop. But as we've done in organizations like Visa and creating situational awareness of very complex entities and then real-time uh, information and knowledge sharing with your entire ecosystem and the financial sector as a whole you know, stands as a, uh, an example of that. We've demonstrated that we can do organizational situational awareness. We can share that in real-time amongst ourselves. And, and, and finally, that 
the, the other major component, uh, I believe, of, uh, uh, of this knowledge sharing that we need to get in, inside our heads, it has come up with, with each of your comments, is that it's not one way from the government, that in fact the, the private sector owns and operates the vast majority of all of this and contains the vast majority of, of the, the knowledge and, and the information. I mean, quite often, I, I think in, in a lot of sectors, the industry as a whole, we're sort of waiting for the government to, to share with us. And as I know, I've heard uh, Terry and Reed both say that a lot of the value you've found is, is sharing amongst each other. So just interested in your thoughts on all that. So, so I think, you know, in the industrial control segment, you're, you're going to see a lot of that uh, peer sharing of people who have figured out uh, vulnerabilities on their own systems, either by uh, getting attacked or by the good hard work of the people and the engineering staff that they have uh, on contract. And, and that's where it goes down to uh, the anonymity and, uh, and the privacy piece of that sharing. You know, if the, if the standards for sharing information don't allow you to freely give that up, then you're running the risk of uh, your company's name being on the front page of the Washington Post saying, hey, we discovered that there was a vulnerability and, uh, and we're out there. And, and you don't want that. You, you want to be able to freely share the information with your compatriots because you're probably tightly wound into their ecosystem and doing business with all of them as you go. Um, I think that uh, that piece is going to be important in the information sharing. It's beyond just, hey, you know, we should all share information, great idea, let's move forward. That, that's not enough. It's got to go well beyond that. And in fact, that is a critical point. We need to uh, look more at sharing knowledge. You know, it may not be, you know, you're identifying information, but the fact that someone like you had an experience. So I, I think in the aggregate experience of organizations like yours, we, we see the components of, of what we really can't execute on and getting you know, awareness at the national level of, you know, are we under attack on Wednesday or, or not? And that's, and again, well, well, individual issues and standards we need to work on, if, if we don't get that national awareness, then, then you know, the rest isn't going to work. Right? Thank you. I, I think you bring up a, another good point that I touched upon in the opening remarks, which is uh, greater formality um, with respect to the ISACs. So, you, you, you're representing the, um, the, the ICS, um, industrial control system sector. Um, we participate in the national health ISAC, but we have manufacturing um, that are run by SCADA systems, industrial control systems. So should I be participating in that? And then where do you draw the line? Because one could argue we should be participating in the financial services one because we process a you know, credit card. There's a whole bunch of – and so – I'm, I'm looking for, and, and hopefully through the framework, that could be something that could be addressed. Without stifling innovation, um, how do you provide greater formality that you're not doing that? In fact, one of the things, I, it, it reminds me a lot of when I started in my career as an Army officer, as an intelligence officer in the Army, of trying to pull together a common picture from all the different feeds that were out there. Um, and there's been a lot of work that's been done to provide that um, direct to the warfighter single picture in the last decade, um, you know, 15 years. And I'm wondering if there can't be lessons that we draw from there that allows us to get that tailored for our individual needs, both from your, um, your sector and in the health, health sector as well. Great. But I think there are exactly those, those lessons as well, as you find out there, you know, individual organizations need to be able to go to a center and get, you know, not, not all, all of the above. So I see we should have had another panel member join us there. Up in the <laughs> <laughs> so let me, uh, let me interject only because of the clock and uh, uh, finish with just a, a, a heartfelt thank you to the panel for sharing your viewpoint with us. I think one of the you know, common themes that was very apparent in that last discussion is the incredible role of leveraging here and partnering and collaboration that can happen in the framework. That's really one of the unique characteristics here. One of the areas we didn't touch on is, is the international aspect of that, but it was touched on in many of your comments. Uh, one of the advantages, we talked about this not being uh, one directional from government to industry. One of the things industry can do uniquely that the government cannot is it operates naturally at market scale, and that today is global, and I think uh, provides an opportunity perhaps where the framework can uh, give participating companies somewhat of a first mover advantage in shaping 
uh, what will be global standards, certainly in this space, and that's a critical thing to keep in mind. Uh, in the interest of time, though, I would uh, like to draw this first panel to a close, so if you would all join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you. We'll take just a 15-minute break and be back at 11. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you.